بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى اما بعد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وجنبنا الفواحش والمعاصي والخطايا والزلف السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته dear respected brothers elders and people listening at home it looks like we've lost much of our attendance to probably Spain versus Germany, but inshallah we'll carry on as it is. And if you can remember from the last lesson, let's, let's do a bit of a quick recap. So this is actually session two, carrying on from the first session, which we did about six weeks ago. So I am going to be asking questions. So I'm hoping people have had their uh, supper or dinner as well. So who did we discuss last time, last lesson? Does anybody know? Umar al Mukhtar, and he's from? Libya. He's from Libya, modern day Libya. So one lesson we extracted from his life was the strength of Muslims has never been numerical. It's never been in large number of soldiers or large number of adherents or religionists. It's always been in strength of conviction and strength, strength of faith as well. So that theme carries on. And as you can see on the board, we've actually got the resistance. So that's the title for this series. It's probably going to be monthly, not every week. And... If you didn't see the poster, we're going to be talking about uh, exploring the lives of different anti-colonial Muslim heroes from across the globe as well. So that's why if we move into the next one, so that's actually the poster. So if you see at the bottom, we've got the Libyan flag and that was Umar al-Mukhtar. So I've actually kept the, uh, the subjects of each lecture hidden just so it builds that suspense. So can anybody decipher the flag for this lesson? It's pretty, pretty simple. Can anybody identify the flag for session number two? Turkish. Turkish flag, Turkish flag. What about number three, anybody, maybe? Might be a bit more difficult. Algeria. Number three is Algeria. Number four? Algeria. Number five, you definitely will not get it. I can guarantee you that. No, it's, it's close. We're talking maybe a Central Asian country. So we're along the right lines there. But we'll leave it as a uh, surprise to that lesson. So. At the start of last lesson, what we did was 10 minutes, we just discussed history and why it's actually important. And I'm hoping these sessions will raise awareness because, alhamdulillah, all of our mosques are filled with, we've got lectures on Quranic commentary, then we've got expositions on the sayings of the Prophet wasallam. then we've got all these different conferences and all these different seminars, but I've yet to see a series dedicated to history. And that's probably because it's very understudied and underrepresented. Because, as we mentioned last lesson, people think it's boring. It's just a bunch of facts and figures and statistics just thrown at you and you expect it to just compute it like a piece of software and then just regurgitate it out. And that's not what history is all about. We've actually got two reasons as to why we've actually started and initiated these sessions. Number one is, we want to take inspiration from our Muslim heroes, which is very simple. And what I hope to do is, through these Muslim heroes, connect you back to the meta heroes or the ultimate heroes of our Islamic tradition and they are very simply the companions عنهم, and the Prophet so everything that we do should channel back to the Prophet because he's the ultimate source of guidance and salvation number two is and I'm hoping at the start of each of these sessions we can just talk about a few important points about history so we can build up let's say a bit of a catalogue if somebody asks you why would you even study history or why would you listen to lectures to do with history why would you spend maybe an hour coming here when you could be sat at home watching the football so there's, there's, there's a genuine need to study it there's an academic called Mark Twain and I'm sure people must have heard the, the uh, phrase which is history often repeats itself that's not entirely correct and he's adjusted that and amended that to now say history often rhymes and there's a very important reason for that because if history often repeated itself repeated itself verbatim the same things happen over and over again then would we be stumbling into the same ditch and the same hole time and time again if history did repeat itself literally verbatim then we'd see this happened in the past so let's not repeat it but history isn't that straightforward it often rhymes and for you to then discern and for you to analyze and pinpoint the rhyming patterns take somebody of a sound and piercing intellect so you have to study in order to recognize the patterns and then once you've joined the dots together then you can see right i can predict in the future such and such a thing might happen so history often rhymes not repeats itself and what we can say is today the biggest the the, the biggest challenge that we face as a muslim community isn't actually something novel and it's been around for nearly one millennium 
which is quite surprising. The challenge that we face today, you might think, how's it been around for 1,000 years? It's been nearly 1,000 years since the Crusaders took Al Masjid al Aqsa, since they captured Jerusalem. And what you notice is these Crusades have persisted over history, but they've just taken different garbs, they've just taken different camouflages, and they've just taken different costumes. Once the Crusades finished, then the Western world moved into the next phase of its project, of its campaign, which was colonialism. And when colonialism was eventually put to a halt, people around the globe were celebrating the demise of these imperialist colonialist powers. Little did they know, during the e era and age of colonialism, these colonialist powers had planted their seeds for the next phase, which was intellectual colonialism, which is where you're made to feel inferior, where you're made to feel completely dependent on your colonial masters and your overlords. And we see that today around the Muslim world. People are facing an identity crisis when it comes to their religion of Islam. Why? Because they think that ultimate success lies in the Western model of life and in Western technology and advancement. And the entire Western sphere of life and politics is governed by secularism, which is, people like to call secularism the detachment of God from the state. But I read a quote the other day which ups the ante, which is actually the murder of God by the state. Secularism is where you take God out of the equation completely. On paper, it's, you know what, from a judicial point of view, from a political, economic point of view, we don't want religion to do anything with any of that. Let's just relegate it to a side dish that you can practice at home. Keep religion in the house, don't bring it outside of the house. But now you can see how even in, within our safe spaces, like our mosques and our institutions and even our houses, we aren't safe, and we aren't secure from this pervasive intellectual colonialism where our way of life, our model of life that's been inherited from generation to generation all the way from our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is now being, subver is now being subverted. So you can see how there's a, there's a trend from the Crusades to colonialism and now to intellectual colonialism. From all those flags, you can see how we're trying to build sort of a um, multi-ethnic and multinational series. And there's a reason for this. There's a reason why we've got so many flags here. And this ties into one reason, or the main reason actually, why Muslims today are so disunited. Why Muslims today are being pounced upon from every single direction. Why Muslims are now, as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, a time will come, yushiku an al umam. A time will come when Muslims will, like, will be like a platter of food. And people will be inviting one another, hey, come and join the food, hey, come and join, you've got dawah in front of you. Everybody's being called to take a piece of the cake. And you can see that happening today in the world. There's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. And the main reason is we've forgotten a very important point of our religion, which is called the ummatic paradigm, the ummatic framework, which is every single one of us here has an identity. An identity which transcends nationality, which transcends ethnicity, which goes beyond and surpasses all of these artificial labels that we've been given. And it predates our life, it predates our forefathers, it predates even our own nations. India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and this goes all the way back to the life of the Prophet ﷺ. We, me and you, every single one of us here today, all 1.8 billion Muslims on the face of this earth right now, belong to a global movement, which has existed from the time of the Prophet ﷺ, which is the Ummah, which is the Muslim nation. And the Ummah doesn't discriminate between ethnicity, between social status, between anything. As long as you're a Muslim, then you're connected automatically. And one misconception that we have is this ummah is restricted to the time that we live in. So all the Muslims today living on the globe at this moment in time, they are classed as the ummah and I'm part of this ummah. But this ummah actually stretches back to the Prophet ﷺ. Every single Muslim that's come from the Prophet all the way up until now is part of the ummah and we belong to that ummah. So there should be a sense of belonging and a sense of affinity that I belong to them and they belong to me. And they are my brothers in faith, faith and they are my brethren as well even though we may, we may be distanced by a thousand years and a thousand miles. And not only that, but keep this point in mind, the people to come in the future, posterity, our succeeding generations, they are also part of the Ummah. And when you are part of the Ummah, the Prophet ﷺ has pretty much summed it up into one phrase. He said, the example of the Muslims is like one body. If one limb of the body, if one part of the body is aching, then the entire body responds with fever and with discomfort. So, if anything happened in the past, we should feel it, we should take it to heart, we should feel a, a stab at our heart. If anything tragic happened to the Muslims in the past. 
and even if anything ha tragic happened to the Muslim today and especially if tragedy were to befall the Muslims in the future now the future is in our hands we can control what happens to our future generations and they are also part of the Ummah so I really want you to keep in mind this Ummatic paradigm because look we've got we're discussing people from Libya people from Turkey people from Algeria India and also the last mysterious nation as well which just shows that we are connected by one thing which is Islam and if we forget that one connection between every single one of us that's when and we've witnessed in history and we'll talk about it today when we forget our ultimate identity which is Islam then we will be subjected to attacks from all four sides and we will be torn apart like we like we have been and like we are being today so if we move on now also although we're going to be talking about Turkey Turkey as a, as, as a nation only came about, was only created in 1924. Before that, it was the Ottoman Empire. So even countries that we visit on a day-to-day -day basis, on, you know, that we always hear about, they are novelty ideas of the last century. And they were only created in the last 100 years, in the lifetime of our grandfathers as well. So now, before we even get into the Ottoman Empire, there are four really devastating incidents for Muslims that have happened across our history. And it's very important that these four incidents and these four tragedies aren't removed from our collective conscience. Because if they are, then we've forgotten where we came from. And if we forget where we came from, then we won't know where we're going in the future. And I think these four incidents, they require more awareness, lectures and investigations as well. Number one, I want you to try and remember these. Number one is the Spanish Inquisition when Muslims were expelled from the Iberian Peninsula. We're talking about Spain and Portugal. This was in 1492. Number one, a devastating incident. And Muslims were massacred wholesale. Muslims were forced to convert. Muslims were exiled. And literally within a few generations, 700 years of Muslim presence in the Iberian Peninsula was effaced from the face of the earth. No longer remained. You go to Spain now, you won't see a single Muslim there. But you'll see relics and monuments of the past which just rubbed salt in the wounds. We were there for 700 years, and then within a few generations, we were gone. No, no, there, there wasn't even a, a trace of our existence. So that's number one. Number two, is, number two is the colonization of India, which is very important. And all of these things tie into our collective Muslim identity as part of the Ummah. So number two is colonization. Number three, which people don't actually ever think about, is transatlantic slavery. You might think to do with black African slaves, what does that have to do with Islam? One-tenth of these slaves were actually Muslims. So what happened to one-tenth of millions of these slaves, Muslim slaves, which were take, who were taken to America? What happened to them and what happened to their faith? And what were they subjected to in America as well? So transatlantic slavery. And number four, again, which probably isn't on anybody's radar, is World War I. The events which precipitated World War I and what happened in the aftermath of World War I. The, what happened in the aftermath of World War I, everybody knows, the collapse of the Ottoman state and the abolition of the Caliphate. We're talking about 101 Caliphs in a successive chain from the Prophet ﷺ all the way up until the last Caliph, Sultan Abdul Majid II, gone. Imagine you're a Muslim living in those days. You wake up one day, you get a WhatsApp message, the Caliphate no longer exists. An institution which has lasted for over 1,000 years, which is, a, which is a cornerstone of our faith which the Prophet ﷺ represented, which was epitomized by Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali radiallahu anhum, and it's gone. And it happened at the hands of a supposed Muslim as well, somebody who professed faith. It happened from our own side. It was obviously instigated by the European powers. So these four events should never escape our collective memory. So that's what the Ottoman Empire looked like at the height of its power. You can see the Ottoman Empire at its peak, over 50 countries were compacted into its territory over three nations and they had roughly 25 million subjects and the Ottoman Empire in my humble opinion out of all the Muslim empires they are the greatest for a number of reasons maybe if we can host a lecture on that sometime in the future we can talk about them but they are absolutely fascinating as well so imagine this is what they look like roughly 1683 and at the onset of World War One, that's it just restricted to modern day Turkey maybe the Levant, which is Syria, Jordan, Palestine, Lebanon. And bear in mind, all of these countries never existed in 1914. Can you see any of those countries on the map? Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine, they didn't exist. It was just one whole landmass called Sham, which is the Levant. That's the historical region. And then you've got the Hijaz. Again, Saudi Arabia never existed. It was called the Hijaz. Hijaz meaning the Arabian Peninsula. So 
those, the lands which are highlighted in green, shaded in green, that's all the Ottomans had when it came to 1914. Now, if anybody can remember the title, what's the title of this talk? A bit of a funny word at the start, bulwark, which just means protector or guardian. Bulwark is actually uh, the, the rampart or the, or, the, or the frontal walls of a, of a fortress which keep the enemy out. So the bulwark of what? Bulwark of Medina. So now the setting, the backdrop for our story today is in Medina. And Medina is a fascinating city. And it's exceptionally important for Muslims because it's always been the unofficial capital. Now the reason why I say unofficial capital is because during the Prophet's time, quick trivia, what was the capital of the Prophet's state? Medina, obviously. During Abu Bakr's reign? It was Medina. Umar's reign? Medina. Uthman's reign? Ali's reign? Kufa. It was changed to Iraq in Kufa. Then during the Umayyad dynasty, it was then transferred to Damascus, which is the, the capital of the Muslim state. During the Abbasid period, Baghdad. And then during the Ottoman Caliphate, it was, well, it, it was actually transferred to Cairo for about two, 250 years. After that, it was transferred to Istanbul. So Medina really hasn't been the center of any political strife or any really major events. But whenever Medina has become the backdrop for any battle or any setting of warfare, then that's when heroes are born and heroes are created and villains come to the front. Just like, for example, at the Battle of the Trench during the life of the Prophet ﷺ, the treacherous Jews of Banu Quraida, their true nature was exposed. And they were punished severely because they colluded with the enemy. They, they committed treason. They betrayed the Muslims. Then we had the Battle of Harra, which took place in the year 683. That was during the Umayyad time. When again, a Muslim army attacked Medina and hundreds of uh, successors to the companions were killed as well. And there was uh, anarchy following the battle in Medina, the Battle of Harra. And then we had, for example, who was the mentor of Salahuddin al Ayyubi? Everybody knows Salahuddin, but nobody knows where he acquired all of his information from. Who was the mastermind behind this Muslim hero? Nuruddin Zengi. So Nuruddin Zengi, during his time, he was a precursor to Salahuddin. Nuruddin Zengi, and I'm sure people have heard this story, he actually foiled the plot by Western Europeans to exhume the body of the Prophet This is why now, so Medina is the backdrop for heroes and villains. And even the Prophet said, Medina is such a city which removes dirt and filth just like iron when it's, pla when it's put through a blast furnace. So Muslims who are tested in Medina, they, they then, the best of faith is brought out in them. So here, the setting of our story today is in Medina. So we're going to fast forward all the way to the Ottoman state in World War I. Now, we can't really go into the story without talking about the history. And again, people might think, what on earth does World War I have to do with the Muslims? World War I has everything to do with Muslims. But you'll never ever study anything like this in, in school. In school, in our textbooks, we're talking about, especially in India and in Western states, there's a systematic suppression of facts especially when it comes to British colonialism and what the West have done. And if you ever get time, go onto YouTube and write down Dr. Shashi Tharoor. So he's an Indian academic and historian. He's got a few maybe outlandish views when it comes to Pakistan, but that's just uh, Indian nationalists in general. But he's an expert when it comes to British colonialism. And his, his lectures are amazing, absolutely phenomenal. He's so eloquent as well. And he talks about how in the West, there's a collective amnesia where people don't want to talk about their colonial history. And he says, and now keep this in mind, we're talking about colonialism. He said, don't hold it against people of today because it's got nothing to do with them, but make sure you never forget it because these things repeat. History is often cyclical. A cycle will always be continuously evolving when it comes to day-to-day -day events. And those things will have happened in the past and they'll repeat in the future. Not verbatim, but with a rhyming scheme, just like Mark Twain said. So, does anybody know when the Arab lands actually came into the um, Ottoman domains? Because the Ottoman state was created in 1299 by... Who was, it, who was it created by? Who was the founder of the Ottoman state? Please, please don't say Arturuth. It wasn't, it wasn't Arturuth. Usman Ghazi, who was Arturuth's son. And I might rustle a few feathers here, but if you're watching the Arturuth show, then out of all the facts that we have present before us about Arturuth, we can say for sure he existed. That's as much as we know about Arturuth. And you'd be surprised, there are some historians who actually debate whether he was a Muslim or not. Now, we won't go into that, but you can see how we have a dearth of information on Arturuth. So what I'm trying to say here is, 
if you're watching Arturo, then don't take it to be pure fact. It is, it is fictional and it is a dramatization of history. So just keep that in mind. So Usman Ghazi was the founder, 1299. Now, the Arab lands never came into Ottoman hands all the way up until the year 1517. So if you go back to this, you can see the, um, the lightly shaded green areas, Damascus, Jerusalem, North Africa, they only came into Muslim territory, in, in, into, not Muslim, sorry, into Ottoman hands in 1517 at the hands of Sultan Salim I. And he was actually the grandson of Muhammad al-Fatih. And he was the first one. Now again, he was the first one to actually be, uh, be actually, uh, to, he's the first one to actually be labeled as a caliph. So they weren't actually khulafa, they weren't actually caliphs from day one. Usman Ghazi was just a sultan. He was just uh, an amir, he was just a leader. He was just a, uh, someone who was invested with authority. But they actually inherited the title of caliph. We talked about the title of khalifa of the Prophet in the year 1517 by Sultan Salim I. And who's been to Top Kapi Museum here? Who's been to Top Kapi Museum? So you've seen all the relics that are housed in the Top Kapi Museum. Where do you think they came from? They came from Sultan Salim's reign. The caliph was actually in Baghdad. There was already a caliph in Baghdad. So Sultan Salim actually took control. He fought against the Mamluks. They were another Muslim dynasty in North Africa. They controlled all the Arab domains. And he fought the Mamluks, defeated them in battle. And there was a, an Abbasid caliph who managed to survive. The Abbasid caliphate, if you can jog your memories, 1258, completely abolished in Baghdad by the... By the, by the Mongols. But one surviving member of the Abbasid royal family actually fled and escaped to Cairo. And he was then propped up as a new shadow caliphate in Mamluk-controlled Egypt. And this continued all the way up until 1517, where Sultan Salim, he's now defeated the Mamluks. So what do you do with the caliph? He took the caliph with him back to Istanbul. And now this authority, this religious and political authority was now transferred to Sultan Salim I. Now you have the first Ottoman caliph. So from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu these what we call, they're called the uh, prophetic relics, the um, Amanati Muqaddasa, which were then passed down from the Prophet to Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Umayyads, then to the Abbasids. And it was kept with the Caliph as cherished possessions and articles of the Prophet Sallallahu So when Sultan Salim took the Caliph Al-Mutawakkil back to Istanbul, he, it was also part of the ceremony to transfer the prophetic relics over to the new, to the new caliph. So when Sultan Salim received, he received the mantle of the Prophet ﷺ, some clothes, some artifacts, some personal possessions. He housed them in the, uh, in the guarded inner sanctuary of the Top Kapi Palace. So that's the history behind all of these sacred relics that you see in the Top Kapi Palace. There's, there's a whole history behind them as well. So now... When Sultan Salim I was inaugurated as a caliph, he now adopted the title Khadim al Haramain al Sharifain. He, he adopted the title of the custodian, the servant of the Haramain, Mecca and Medina. And his son was Sultan Suleiman, Suleiman the Magnificent, Suleiman al Qanuni. He then expanded Ottoman territory in Arabia as well. And he brought Baghdad under its reign and a few of the North African states. So now you've got these Arab provinces consolidated under Ottoman rule. And this lasted all the way up until World War I. Now the Hijaz, Hijaz region, remember, Mecca and Medina, you can say it's modern day Saudi Arabia. They occupied a very special place in the Ottoman Caliphate. And obviously, why wouldn't it? Because it's the birthplace of Islam. And it held some very important spiritual authority and even prestige with the Ottomans themselves. Now, even though the Ottomans were the rulers of the Hijaz region, their rule, although it was supreme, was largely tokenistic. So they said, you know what, we're going to be the overlords of Hijaz. However, main political authority and the day-to-day -day running of affairs will be invested within a very spiritually orientated family in Mecca called the Sharifans, the Sharifs of Mecca. And the Sharifs of Mecca were direct descendants of the Prophet Sallallahu And they hailed from the descendancy of Hassan radiallahu who is a grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu So they were part of the Ahlul Bayt. They were, they were from the prestigious family of the Prophet Sallallahu And from the time of the Abbasids, they recognized, if you want to keep the people of Arabia happy, 
then let the Sharifs of Mecca have their own individual rule in Mecca and Medina and in the Hijaz region. And everybody respected the Sharifs, everybody acknowledged them. There'd always be one Grand Sharif who'd oversee the day-to-day -day operations and the economic flow in the Hijaz region. So this carried on throughout the Abbasid reign, throughout the Mamluk reign. And when Sultan Salim now comes into power, he now confers some some very prestigious and privileged titles on the Sharif to say, you know what, even though I'm the, Sul I'm the Sultan, I'm the Caliph, I respect your authority and your prestige as the Sharif of Mecca. So that's how the lands of Hijaz and Mecca and Medina were ruled all the way up until, remember like we said, World War I. Now, there'd always been cordial relations between the Ottomans and the Sharifs. Things started to change when we, came, when we come to the end of the 1700s. From 1774, we now enter a new period of Ottoman history called the period of dismemberment, where Ottoman lands were being snatched and taken away and were being literally taken straight from Ottoman hands and given to different European states. The Russians were taking their share of the cake, the Italians were taking North Africa, Libya, the British, the French, everybody wanted a peace. Everybody was dismantling the Ottoman state because they'd grown weak. And Towards the end of the 1800s now, this is where problems start to rise. You now have, I remember, throughout the 1800s, the Sultan, unfortunately, and the Caliph, remember, he's still a Caliph, was reduced to just a puppet, who was being controlled by his puppeteers. And the puppeteers, at this moment in time, were the, the divan of the Ottoman state, the executive branch, which was run by the Grand Vizier. And the Grand Vizier of the Ottoman state, you could say, was similar to the Prime Minister today. The Prime Minister that we have in England, think of it, like the relationship between the monarch and the uh, government. The caliph was like the monarch, and then the prime minister was the grand vizier. So all power had been invested into the hands of the prime minister. So he was the one calling the shots. He was the one running the show. Towards the end of the 1800s, now people were scared. Chaos was starting to spread amongst the Ottoman lands. Why? Because these European states are taking all of our lands for ourselves. The Balkan states, now if you look at this map, look at all these Balkan states. Romania, Bulgaria, you've got Greece, Albania, uh, you had Kosovo as well, Bosnia, all of these lands were once under Muslim rule. All of these lands were ruled by the Ottomans. And it was only in the last 100 years when things started to change. So Ottomans themselves, Turks, thought to themselves, we've got a problem. How do we solve this problem? And even within Europe, there was a, a derogatory title which was given and designated to the Ottomans. Anybody know what it was? The sick man of Europe. So to say that he doesn't belong here, he's on his deathbed, and when he does eventually die, we can inherit all of his lands. So the Ottomans were known as the sick men of Europe. And the Turks themselves didn't like this. So you had different movements and different organizations which sprung up towards the end of the 1800s, which sought to curb and halt this constant decline of the Ottoman state. One of those groups was known as, anybody know, a very famous group, the Young Turks, the CUP, the community of unity and progress. You can see how they had these very appealing slogans as well, unity and progress. So what they wanted to do was they wanted to take power away from the Sultan and put it into a constitutional government. So we can make the decisions and we can curb the power and the authority that the Sultan has. Now, towards the end of the 1800s, we now see the rise of the last great Ottoman Sultan and his name was Sultan Abdul Hamid II. And he was known as the last great Ottoman Sultan because he tried to wrestle power away from the Young Turks and bring it back to the Sultan. And he had his whole campaign known as Pan-Islamism, which is everybody has to unite under one banner. And what's that one banner? Islam. He was trying to counter the Young Turks. And the Young Turks had introduced a new idea into the Muslim world, which was unheard of before in the Muslim world. They'd actually exported it from the European lands, and that was called nationalism, where everybody feels a sense of pride and they boast about their own nationality. Now remember, Muslims, we can have our nationality, we can have a sense of belonging to our nationality, but our nationality should never take precedence over the Ummah. We should never think, I'm not going to help people in Pakistan because I'm from India. Or you should never think, I'm not going to help people in Kashmir because I'm from Bangladesh. You should never think, I'm in the UK, what should, whatever, whatever happening, whatever's happening in North Africa or Syria or Palestine, what, what should that have to do with me? Because I'm not Palestinian, I'm not, I'm not from Kashmir, I'm not Pakistani. 
Our ummah, our ummatic, our identity should surpass everything else. So he tried to reel the Muslims back and say, look, your ultimate identity lies in being a Muslim. The young Turks were saying, no, no, we're going to have a whole, what's called, turf Turkification process, where you're going to now be given prestige and honor if you're a Turk. We want to then prop up this Turkish nationality. So obviously what happened then was the Arabs felt alienated. The Arabs felt like we were part of this Ottoman state for so long. And one reason why the Ottomans were so magnificent and fabulous, and the reason why they managed to last for so long, was because their policy was very simple. People were grouped together, not by their nationality, not by their ethnicity, not by their race, but by their religion. So, it doesn't matter if you were a Kurd, or a North African, or an Arab, or if you were from the Balkans, if you were a Turk, if you were a Muslim, you belonged to the Ottoman Empire. You belong to this whole body of Muslims. That's why people felt a sense of belonging and affinity to the Ottomans. Even non-Muslims, because they'd been so welcomed into the Ottoman state, they felt like fighting for the Ottomans, especially in the Balkans. Now, when things started to turn south, when people started to turn towards nationalism, it started to marginalize people. These Arabs started to feel like we don't belong in the Ottoman state anymore. Arab governors were replaced by the young Turks with Turkish people. There was a whole Turkification process when our Arabic was taken out to the curriculum, people were first forced to learn Turkish. Governance was taken away and stripped away from these Arab governors and everything was being flowed and channeled back to the Turkish central government. So the Arabs were feeling left out. It's within this backdrop that we now visit our setting today of Medina. Now Sultan Abdul Hamid, when he came into power with his policy of pan-Islamism, he tried to bring everybody under one banner. And to do that, he created something, the remnants of which we can still see today. Does anybody know what he's famous for? A huge, massive construction project. The, the Hijaz Railway, as it's called. That was built between 1900 and 1908. And you can see here, all those lines are actually the railroad routes of the Hijaz Railway. And it sought to connect, and it did actually connect Istanbul all the way through the Arab lands to Damascus and through all the way to Medina. And this policy of his was to facilitate for pilgrimage and to improve economic and political integration of the Arab provinces into the Ottoman state. It was to move troops around so that if there was an uprising within the Arab states, troops could be deployed to Arabia within five days. Pilgrims could reach Mecca and Medina from Istanbul in five days. And that was unprecedented, that was unheard of before. And it was also to support the poorer areas. So you can see how Sultan Abdul Hamid is trying to bring everybody back under this one banner of Islam. And unfortunately, there's always a principle of history pointed out by Sheikh Abul Hassan Ali Nadwi. He says, during the last waning, dying days of any empire, of any dynasty, it's Allah's will, it's Allah's mysterious plan where the most capable of people and the most religious of people are propped up but it's little too late. And it just goes to show, one point there, it just goes to show it's not a one-man effort, it's a team effort. One man can't change everything. Just because he's a caliph doesn't mean he has the power to now stop everything. All Muslims have to unite under his banner. All Muslims have to unite under the caliphate. And just to remind you, it's been nearly 100 years that we haven't had a caliphate. And even though people try to scoff at the caliphate, saying we don't need it today, it's an integral part of our religion. It's actually, as part of Islamic law, it's a fardul kifaya. It's a communal obligation to appoint a caliph. Nasbul imam, nasbul khilafa, nasbul khalifa is a communal obligation. Every single one of us, and this is a scary, daunting fact, on the day of judgment will be asked by Allah, what did you do to help reinstate the caliphate? Now obviously, within our limits, there are different, maybe, there are, there are, there are different things that we can do within our own remit to re-establish a caliphate. So all we can do, so that we can be absolved of our accountability on the judgment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can just say, look, at least make dua that Allah brings around a certain chain of events where Muslims can unite under one banner. And for Muslims, what's the importance of a caliphate? It's very simple. So Muslims can have one meta-identity, which is the ummah. You see today how all of the Gulf countries, how all of these North African states, I mean Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, they are at each other's throats. Why? Because of these artificial borders created by Western states. They don't even see each other as Muslims. They don't even see each other as human beings. Just because of these made-up borders and these made-up nationalities. So Muslims, if there's anything you take away from today's lesson is Muslims need to unite under one banner which is the Ummah. 
And that starts from home. If your home life, if your relations with your friends, family members, colleagues aren't united and aren't cordial, how can you expect to achieve something like that on a global scale? So you always have to think big but start small. So Sultan Abdul Hamid created this umbilical cord for the Ummah, for the Islamic world, which was his Hijaz railway. So you can see that on the, on the right, we also have a picture of the first railway station opened up in Medina. And it's actually been converted into a museum today. And on the left, you can see a map that connects Damascus all the way to Medina as part of uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid's Hijaz railway um, uh, campaign. And these are actually modern day pictures. You can still see the remnants of trains from the railway. And on the right hand side, in some random patch of the desert in Arabia, you can see some, uh, some the, the remnants of the uh, railroads as well from the Hijaz railway system. Now we move on to this person here is actually the antagonist. He's the villain of our story today. Does anybody know who he is? Sharif Hussein. Now that should be ringing alarm bells. What did I just say about the Sharif and family? Who were they? They were the grand leaders of Mecca. So now alarm bells should be ringing if I'm telling you this man is the villain, is the antagonist of our story, Sharif Hussein. You're thinking, how can this man, a descendant, he was a 40th descendant of the Prophet Sallallahu How can he be the villain of our story today? Again, this should put things into perspective. And this should show how Medina brings out the best and the worst in people. So, out of all the policies, Sharif Hussein saw the Hijaz Railway. He was in charge. He was a Grand Sharif of Mecca. He saw the Hijaz Railway as an encroachment on his domain. He thought that if the Ottomans have, now have a railway access into my lands, they're going to be breathing down my neck. They're going to be more intrusive and, eva and, in and invasive into my own policies and into my own day-to-day -day runnings. Because what do people in the past do? We are the overlords, you as the Sharif, you do what you like, we won't interfere. But we saw why Sultan Abdul Hamid wanted to introduce the Hijaz Railway, to bring the Arabs back. The Arabs have always been the saviors of Islam. Arabs always hold a very important, special place for any, for any Muslim. There's a hadith of the Prophet where he says, love the Arabs for three reasons. Number one, because I was an Arab. Number two, because the Quran is in Arabic. And number three, because the language of paradise will be in Arabic. So even though every single Muslim is on an equal footing in the eyes of Allah, except for their God consciousness, we always have to acknowledge and congratulate the Arabs for being Arabs because they're the Prophet ﷺ's people. And they are the people who will, who will ultimately bring about a revolution, who will ultimately bring Islam back to equilibrium, bring it back to its former glory. So he felt threatened. Now, here's where the interesting part comes in. Even before he was made the Sharif of Mecca, his great, grand, ultimate ambition was to become the next Caliph. He wanted to become the king of Arabia. He wanted to become the king of Arabia. These were his ambitions. But Sultan Abdul Hamid, he was actually deposed in 1909. Sultan Abdul Hamid, the young Turks kicked him out. They deposed and dismissed Sultan Abdul Hamid and they forced their way into power. And the first, one of the first things they did was in the Hijaz region was to appoint Sharif Hussein as the Grand Sharif of Mecca. As soon as Sultan Abdul Hamid heard about this, he was always, he always has a, he always has a sense of this foreboding, where he always knew that something bad was going to happen. The moment Sharif Hussein was put into place, he said, you know what, now you can class the Hijaz lands as lost. They're as good as lost to the Ottomans because Sharif Hussein is in charge. So he had a sense of foresight and insight which nobody else had so in you've got a few events which precipitated the um, the siege of Medina now. so in 1910 what happened was Medina was under the governance of the Hijaz region which means that Sharif Hussein was then the um, authority over Hijaz in 1910 what did the young Turks do they took Hijaz they took Medina out of the Hijaz governance and put it directly into the interior minister interior ministry now. So now Medina was made an independent, what's called an independent Sanjak in Turkish, an independent governorate. So they have to report directly to the Ottoman interior ministry and that hurts um, Sharif Hussein because he felt as if authority was being taken away from him slowly but surely. You also had in 1916, just after the outbreak of the war, you had some of the leaders of the Young Turks. Now they were always, they always had a sense of distrust with Sharif Hussein and there was a very tense and volatile visit that two members of the uh, Young Turk organization actually made to Medina itself. 
One was Enver Pasha, who was the minister of war. He was the minister of war. And just to put that on hold for a second, in World War I, you had two main camps. You had the Triple Entente on one side, made up of France, Britain, and Russia. On the other hand, you had the Central Powers. We're talking about World War I here. Number one, obviously, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottomans. The Ottomans entered into World War I on the side of Germany and Austria, Hungary. Now, Sultan uh, Muhammad V, Sultan Mehmed V, Vahiuddin, he was very reluctant to enter into the war, even though Germany and the Ottoman state had been allies since the uh, late 1800s. Who was the German leader, the German supreme leader who, init who was uh, responsible for uh, Germany's entry into World War I? Kaiser Wilhelm II. He was so friendly with the Ottomans and so friendly with the Muslims towards the end of the 1800s, and he was the only friend. The Germans lent a shoulder for the Ottomans to cry on towards the end of the 1800s, when everybody else had abandoned them. So he was so friendly with the Ottomans that he was, a rumor had spread that he actually went for Hajj, became a Muslim, Kaiser Wilhelm II. And the Arabs knew him with an affectionate title of Haji Kaiser. Yeah, so they knew him as Haji Kaiser. So why did Kaiser Wilhelm II do this? When it comes to politics, everybody has their own interests in mind. Everybody has ulterior motives. The Germans, as painful as it might sound to the Ottomans, they didn't care about the Ottoman state. They didn't care about the Muslims. It was all about their own political interests. What did they see? They saw, Kaiser Wilhelm saw Sultan Abdul Hamid as a very powerful figure. Sultan Abdul Hamid is the leading Muslim global figure. If I can have him on my side, if ever I need him, he can make a call for jihad and the entire Muslim world will rally behind him. And that's exactly what happened in 1914. The last official call for jihad ever made by a caliph was for World War I. For the Muslims to enter into World War I. Now Sultan Mehmed V, he, two British and French diplomats came to Istanbul in 1914 to try and coax the Ottomans into not entering the war because they knew that the Germans were their allies. Unbeknownst to all of them, Enver Pasha, the minister of war in Turkey, had already entered into a secret agreement with the, with the Germans, known as the Turkish-German Alliance, that we will enter the war with you. Now, when agreement, when uh, negotiations were still taking place, news reached Sultan Muhammad V that Enver Pasha had already entered into an agreement. So now he's in a bit of a sticky situation because remember, true executive power was in the hands of who? The Sultan or the Young Turks? The Young Turks. So Sultan Abdul Hamid couldn't go against any directive from them. So next morning when the telegraph came to his, uh, uh, his palatial residence, he said, you know what, that's it. What can I do? Let's enter into the war with Germany. So that's it. They're into the war. The Sheikh al-Islam, the Grand Mufti of the entire Muslim world, based in Istanbul, Uruplu Bey was his name. He issued five fatawa, five legal edicts, encouraging the Muslim world to enter into jihad against Britain and France against the Entente powers. Five fatawa. And the Muslim world rallied towards its cause. So Kaiser Wilhelm had achieved his goal because you now have got a global Muslim response to jihad. And that's the only reason why the Germans ever entered into an alliance. Why? Because they wanted that call for jihad. Because they knew how much Muslims valued the Caliph, valued the religious institution, and valued the institution of jihad as well. So anyway, let's just... Uh, to go back to wheel ourselves back into where we were. So, Sharif Hussein. So, Enver Pasha, he visits Medina, and there are tensions boiling here. Some of the Arab Bedouins who were on the side of Sharif Hussein even plotted to kill Enver Pasha and Kamal Pasha. To, um, we're not talking about Mustafa Kamal, this is another Kamal Pasha. So, Kamal Pasha, they were both there, and they were the, a, a planned assassination was uh, orchestrated, but it was uh, thwarted at the last moment. So, when they eventually left, then there was an air of distrust. Sharif knew that something was up when Kamal and Enver Pasha visited. And those two, Enver and Kamal, knew that something was up. Sharif was brewing something in the background. And sure enough, all of these incidences, they factored in towards um, Sharif Hussein's insecurity. And that all led up to one very, very secret, top secret, confidential agreement which took place between Sharif Hussein and the British. There are three agreements which took place during World War I which changed the course of the entire world. That's not an understatement. 
changed the course of the entire world, especially the Muslims. This is the first one of them. The Sharif Hussein and McMahon correspondence, as it, as, as it was called. This began in July 1915. McMahon was the British High Commissioner in Egypt, and Sharif Hussein was a Grand Sharif in Mecca. Now, Sharif Hussein was in cahoots with the British. Now, before that, Sharif Hussein had actually approached the British, saying, you know what, I'll pledge allegiance to your cause against the Ottomans if you can recognize my sovereignty in the Hejaz region. If you can acknowledge, and if you can then commit to acknowledging and respecting us, the Sharif and family, as kings in Hijaz, in the entire Arabian domain, then we'll help you fight against the Ottomans. But before that, the British didn't want anything to do with them because they thought, what do we have to do with a, um, a desert Bedouin like Sharif Hussein? We've got bigger fish to fry. In 1915, everything changed when the Ottomans entered into the war against the Entente powers. Now Britain saw an opportunity. So McMahon was then approached by Sharif Hussein. McMahon in Egypt and Sharif Hussein in Mecca. So Sharif Hussein made his way all the way to Egypt and they started negotiating. And the negotiations, they were very deceitful, very duplicitous from the side of the British. The British, I'll tell you this for now, from the start they had no intention of honoring any of the agreements made with Sharif Hussein. And this is where we start to see a trend in the last 100 years where Muslims have been used unwittingly as pawns in a European chess game which is exactly what they were. They were just being maneuvered and moved around unbeknownst to them for a higher purpose, to protect the kings and the queens back in Europe. And the agreement was very simple. The British would fund and supply Sharif Hussein and his band of rebels, and he'd give them support and intelligence and weaponry and even the backing of the Royal Navy against the Ottomans. If Sharif Hussein would rebel against the Ottomans, would rebel against his fellow Muslims, would rebel against the Caliph. And if he did that, if he would expel the Ottomans from the Arabian Peninsula, then Britain would acknowledge, you know what, the Arabian lands, they're all yours. That's what it seemed like on the surface of things. But there's always more than meets the eye. Why did the British actually, really, why did they want to engage with Sharif Hussein when they'd refused his meetings for so many years? They saw the Muslim Ummah as weak. They saw, the, they saw a chink in the armor of the caliphate of the Muslims and they saw this as an opportunity to dismantle the caliphate once and for all and to bring the Muslim world into ruin. And that would then lead up into, now this is not, just to bear in mind, everything I'm telling you is not part of some wacky far-fetched conspiracy theory. All of the information is out there, all of it is documented even by the European powers, Britain, France and America, in their archives, all of this information can be found. And for a, um, you, can, you can even search upon their archives as well. Everything can be found there. So this is, this is all fact. It's not, it's not a conspiracy and it's not a uh, fairy tale. The, their prize target in the Arabian lands was Jerusalem. And the British thought, if we can distract the Ottoman garrison in Arabia with Sharif Hussein's revolt, then the pathway to Jerusalem will be clear. And we can take our prized possession, which had been coveted by the Europeans, by the uh, Crusaders for nearly a thousand years. So you can see how there's an evolution. They're just rebranding from Crusades to colonialism to intellectual colonialism, but the substance is the same. The form may be different, but the content and the substance is the same. Which is why, going back to the main point, Muslims have to be aware. Don't be fooled by a change of attire or a change of costume, because whatever's in the heart, of these enemies of Islam still remains the same. So you have to keep that in mind. So that was, all the, that, that was all set in stone now. The deal had been sealed. Now we've got the, the Hussein McMahon correspondence of 1915. And before that actually, Sharif Hussein was a bit of a nobody. The British, again, they wanted to instate a Muslim Pope. That was the words they used. These are the exact words they used. We need a Muslim Pope to do what? To rival the caliphate, to rival the caliph in Istanbul. Why, why, why would they want to undermine the caliph's authority in Istanbul? What call did the caliph make just one year prior? The call to jihad. If you can undermine the caliph, you can undermine the call for jihad. But for that, you need a contender, you need a rival. And the person they saw the most fit for the job, the best suited candidate was Sharif Hussein. I mean, come on, you've got the 40th grandson of the Prophet in your midst. So why don't we weaponize him against ourselves? And this is another reoccurring theme. 
Well, we are used against ourselves. Muslims are used to defeat Muslims. That's what happened in Spain. That's what happened up to the, led, um, um, up to the uh, uh, Crusades. That's what happened in the uh, lead up to Indian colonization, when the, when the Mughals had declined. Muslims were fighting amongst each other. When the Umayyad Caliphate in Spain had disintegrated around 1029, the Muslims broke up into 29 petty principalities. It's known as the era of Muluk al-Tawaif, the petty kingdoms. 29 Muslim kingdoms came, coming forth from one, fragmenting from one. And every single one of them, to beat their neighbor, to beat their rival Muslim, they would enlist the help of the Christians from the north. Why don't you come in? We'll give you some territory and you can defeat our Muslim neighbors, just vying for power because of disunity. And look at what's happened to the Muslims. So Sharif Hussein, now he declares his revolt. Now, the, to undermine the authority of the Caliph didn't actually work in the end because Muslims still rallied behind his call. And even though some of the Arabs, they, um, they responded to Sharif Hussein's revolt, majority of the Arabs still held allegiance to the Ottoman Caliph. So, now, Sharif Hussein, 1917. This is, I mean, now, now can you understand why he's the villain of our story here? He's the, one who broke the, he's the one who broke away from the Muslims. A major sin in Islam, a major sin in Islam from the Prophet Sallallahu This is coming directly from him. A major sin is in Islam is to disrupt the solidarity of the Muslims by breaking away from the Caliph. If you become a rebel, if you stage a revolt against the Caliph, then the punishment according to Islamic law, if it's enacted, is execution. For treason, you're, in essence, you're committing mutiny. You're a rebel, you're committing treason. And every single state in the world frowns upon treason. He is committing treason to the highest degree, of the highest level, against the caliph. Against somebody who has invested authorities, political and spiritual, from the Prophet ﷺ all the way up until then. And when this devilish deal was now completed, he initiated his revolt in 1917. Makkah, taken in one month, no problem. Jiddah was the, was the port city, was the main hub of Arabian trading. That was gone in a few moments as well. Medina was the next target. But because of one man, this is where we come to our hero now, our protagonist of the story. Because of one man, the Sharif's task of taking Medina and his ambitions of taking Medina were made one million times more difficult. His problems were compounded. And because of the relent and the stubborn resistance of this one man, the Sharif's task of capturing Medina now became a uh, Sisyphean task for these rebels. Now we can introduce our protagonist, our hero. Can anybody guess his name? Because I know people, as soon as they saw the Turkish Ottoman flag, some people said, oh, you're going to talk about Arturul. Some people say, you're going to talk about Usman Ghazi. You're going to talk about Muhammad Al-Fatih. He is probably one of the most unknown heroes of our Islamic heritage. Hardly anybody knows about him. You've got two pictures of him there. One is on the left, he's the one with the uh, classy cape on. Anybody know his name? His name was Fakhruddin Pasha. Re just remember his name well. His name was Fakhruddin Pasha. And he was affectionately known as Fakhri. Fakhruddin in Arabic means the pride and joy of the religion. And this would foreshadow his legendary status later on. So quickly about Fakhruddin Pasha, and this is... When, when you study World War I history, then you'll notice how everything in the world today is a direct product of what happened in World War I. Everything, all of these nation states, even Saudi Arabia. Does anybody know who the person on the left is? His name is Amir al Saud. He is the son of King Abdul Aziz of Saud, Ali Saud. Does that ring any bells? Ali Saud, Saudi Arabia. Yeah, so Saudi Arabia, again, it might, be a bitter swill, uh, uh, it might be a bitter pill to swallow, but the early Saud, the Saudi family were also in cahoots with, surprise, surprise, the British. Simultaneously, whilst the British was, were providing and supplying Sharif, he was also supplying the Saud family. And the Saud family and the Hashemite Sharif family were at each other's necks. They were bitter rivals. So you can see how the British are enacting one of their most famous, yet most effective policies in history, which is divide and conquer, divide and rule. You can see what they're doing in Makkah and Medina. We're talking about the birthplace of Islam. 
and their duplicitous dealings are so pervasive. They, you can't even escape them in Mecca and Medina as well. So that's just uh, an interesting fact as well. That's Amir al Saud. So Fakhruddin Pasha, he was born in 1868. So 1916, how old does that make him? Nearly 50 years old. So how old was Umar al-Mukhtar? Let's jog our memories. When he started his uh, resistance against the Libyans, uh, against the Italians in Libya. He was almost 60 years old. So you can see a trend here. These people are way past their heyday. They are way past their prime and the vigor of youth. And yet they are still willing to sacrifice everything. The little that they have, they're still willing to sacrifice it. Which just goes to show, as long as the, the, the lamp and lantern of faith is still burning within you, then your body will find the strength. And I read a quote from Ibn Taymiyyah before, and this should really put things into perspective for us. If your soul and your mind finds, is, is passionate about doing something, your body will find the strength for it. If you are passionate about reading your Fajr in the mosque, I'm talking to myself here, then your body will find the strength to lift that duvi off in the morning. If you are really passionate about studying, then your body, no matter how tired it may be, will find a way to study. If you are passionate about spending in the path of Allah, spending for religious causes, even if it might be difficult for your body, even if it might be difficult for your hand to reach into your pocket or to make a few clicks on a card machine, to part with some money, your body will find a way to do it. So you have to work on your heart. Everything comes from the heart. And I know now there's, it's, quite a, it's quite a liberal orientated slogan, which is, it's all about the heart. It doesn't matter if I pray salah. It doesn't matter if I dress Islamic. It doesn't matter if I hold Muslim values. It's all about the heart. Don't judge me. It's all about what's inside the heart. The problem with that is, whatever's inside the heart, if it's pure, will manifest on your limbs. If you truly love the Prophet, that will show through your actions and mannerisms and your characteristics. So working on your heart is very, very important. So 1860, he was born. Does, does anybody know where he was born? It wasn't in Turkey. He was born in Bulgaria. Bulgaria was a Muslim state. Bulgaria was part of the Ottoman Empire. I mean, if, I don't want to go all the way back to that slide. We can see how all of those countries were once part of Eastern Europe. Romania, you even had Poland to an extent, uh, Serbia, Greece, Bulgaria. They were all under Muslim rule. And this is one point you can use against Islamophobes. Uh, considering it's Islamophobia Awareness Month, let's impart some important advice. Islam is as ingrained into European culture as the Europeans are themselves. 732, that's 100 years after the demands of the Prophet ﷺ. Muslims had reached southern France. And they were ultimately defeated. Abdul Rahman al-Ghafiqi, who was the um, Umayyad governor of Cordoba, he was actually defeated by Charles Martel, 732, at the Battle of Tours, the, at, 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 at a place in southern France called Poitiers. And he was defeated. But Western historians have speculated. If Abdul Rahman al-Ghafiqi, let's just all think about this for a second. Just put your thinking caps on. If Abdul Rahman al-Ghafiqi, 732, was successful in his battle against Charles Martel in southern France, we might have now the, the United Caliphate of Britain. You might have France. Paris might have become now the next center of the Muslim Caliphate. Just to speculate. Then you had Spanish rule for 700 years. 700 years we're talking about. The Abbasids made their way into Malta, a tiny island, holiday, popular holiday destination called Malta. And its Muslim history is so rich, we take, it would take us three to four sessions just to talk about it. Abbasid history, then, the, um, then you had the Tahirids from North Africa, they conquered it for 200, 300 years. Sicily, Rhodes, Cyprus. You even had um, parts of the southern tip of Italy as well was under Muslim rule. Then the Ottomans under Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. The, the, uh, the, the utmost borders of the Ottoman state in Europe was all the way in Vienna. There were three abortive, they were unsuccessful, but there were three battles in Vienna that Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent waged against the European powers. So Islam is as ingrained in European culture as the Europeans are themselves. We've been here for as long as European history has. And there's an active effort to wash away this history. Now, how often have you heard about 700 years in Spain? How often have you heard about the Russian states? Ukraine was under Muslim rule. 
Crimea, which was recently annexed 2014 by Russia, that was under Muslim rule, the Crimean Khanate of the Tatars. They were cousins of the Mongols. For hundreds of years, all of these states were under Muslim rule, and they were all slowly, one by one, amputated from the body of the main Ummah. So, and we're reading ourselves back in here. So, he was born in Bulgaria, and he graduated just conscious of time here. I think we'll hope to wrap up in about 20, 25 minutes, inshallah. But this is where things start to get interesting. So he was born in Bulgaria. He graduated from the Maktaba Harbiya, which is the uh, Ottoman Academy of Warfare. And the moment he graduated, he started to assume command positions in the uh, Balkans, especially during the Balkan Wars. And now at the advent of World War I, he was now made the deputy of the Fourth Army of the Ottoman Empire. And that Fourth Army was spearheaded by Kamal Pasha. He was one of the um, uh, Ottoman officials who visited Medina at the outbreak of the war, 1916. In 1916, at the start, now this is where, again, we come across our, the, the, the heroic fabled army known as the Hijaz Expeditionary Force. And, and Fakhruddin, let's just call him Fakhri for short, Fakhri was given command. He was now made the general of the uh, fabled Hijaz Expeditionary Force. And now, one week after, or actually one week before Sharif Hussein staged his revolt in Mecca, remember, Enver Pasha, the Minister of War, he sensed something brewing in Mecca. He had a sense of foreboding. So he sent the Hijaz Expeditionary Force under the leadership of Fakhri Pasha as reinforcements to the um, Medin and garrison. And Fakhri Pasha, I mean, if we just want to sum up his characteristics in a few words, he was a very capable commander. He was an excellent soldier, and you'll see later on through his speeches to his men, he was a stimulating and motivational leader. He had around 14,000 troops at his disposal. Like we said, they arrived there one week before the Hijaz revolt. Now we move to the siege of Medina. That's Fakhri Pasha on the left, and an infamous figure, an infamous figure on the right there. We'll get to him later on, because things start to then intertwine here. Keep, just see if you can figure out who he is, but we'll get to him later on. Now we get to the actual siege of Medina. Remember we were talking about Medina is the backdrop of heroism and villainy in our Muslim history. The siege of Medina was initiated, started just after Mecca and Jidda fell to the Sharifan um, rebellious forces. And it is one of the largest, on record, one of the, lo one of the longest and most protracted sieges ever in history. It lasted for nearly two and a half years, from June 1916 to January 1919. So, Fakhri Pasha was stationed in Medina at the onset of the rebellion. And when he heard about the news, when the telegraph reached him that Sharif Hussein had staged his revolt, he felt strong enough with his force of 14,000 soldiers, backed up by a few Arab tribal Bedouins as well, to go on the counter-offensive. You know what, I'm not going to wait till Sharif makes his way to Medina, I'm going to go on the counter-offensive. The best form of defense is offense. So he made his offensive and he started taking land back from these rebellious Bedouins and he was pushing the Sharifan forces and he was pushing out of the Medinan environs as well. So he was making some serious progress as well. However, he was halted when the Sharif called his um, allies for support and the Royal Navy docked in Jeddah and near the port of uh, near the ports of Medina, they started their bombardments. And the ordinance was too much for um, Fakhri Pasha, so he had to retreat back into Medina, and now the siege commences. Now they start to barricade and fortify themselves in, in um, Medina. Now, imagine, for two and a half years, for two and a half years, Medina can't fall. Now what does that mean to Sharif Hussein? Remember what we said about the duplicitous agreement he made with McMahon? The British would support them as long as Sharif Hussein would get rid of the Ottomans. Now, Medina was the last enclave of the Ottomans in um, the Arabian lands itself. All of Arabia by 1919 had fallen except for Medina. It was the last standing bastion of Islam, of Ottoman supremacy in the Arabian lands itself. Now, if Medina is still standing, then the agreement can't be completed, can it? Because the agreement was, Sharif Hussein removes the Ottomans with the help of the British and they'd now be the sovereigns of the land. Now, as long as the Ottomans are still there, Sharif Hussein can't be declared as the king of Arabia. And that was a problem. That was a very big problem. Because at the same time, whilst Fakhri Pasha, that's 
that's the uh, Medina in the early 1900s. You can see how much has changed. And you can see all of the fortifications as well. So as Medina was holding out against the Sharifans, you had a few other problems brewing for the Sharif. In the southern lands some of Arabia itself, some of these Bedouin tribes, they were threatening to revolt against Sharif Hussein. In the central and eastern provinces of Najd, we've already touched upon them, you had a rival clan and a rival family who were rising up and contending with Sharif and authority. And they were the? The Sa'uds, Ali Sa'ud, the family of Sa'ud. And the story, if we ever go into that one day, of Saudi Arabia goes all the way back to 1703. With the birth of somebody very infamous, a, a Marmite figure you can call him, very controversial. Some love him, some hate him. Anybody know? Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. Yeah, people are throwing around the term today without even knowing where it comes from. Wahhabi, Wahhabi, Wahhabi. Nobody knows anything about it. It all starts with Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. He's a very important figure for um, Saudi Arabian history. That's a story for another time. And he actually, he actually partnered up with a member of the Ali Sa'ud family as early as 1744. So the origins of the state, the first official Saudi state was in 1744. And it was given... Uh, and, and it was actually recognized and given independence in 1925. And maybe we'll get into that sooner on. So, now, there's a problem for Sharif Hussein. Now, he can't be called the King of Arabia as long as Fakhri Pasha is holed up here in Medina. Now, the British officers all convened together. British officers and Sharif Hussein and his sons. He had three sons, by the way. And these three sons, I mean, we can go into a lecture on each and every single one of these. Abdullah, Ali, and Faisal. All three of his sons. They were all, of it. They were all Sharif's commanders. And they all convened a meeting. And proposals were made. How on earth do we dislodge Fakhri Pasha and his troops from Medina? So a few different suggestions were made. And eventually a proposal was made, which was vehemently backed by a young British officer. And his suggestion was, you know what, we need to carry out two strategies. Number one is, let's sever the umbilical cord. What was the umbilical cord in the Muslim world? The Hijaz Railway. Let's sever the Hijaz Railway and at the same time, let's carry up pinprick attacks. The Bedouin forces were in no shape to launch a full frontal assault on Medina. They were still Bedouins at the end of the day. So if they were to carry out, you could say it was the opposite, the reverse of guerrilla tactics, where you've got a um, hold up force and carry out small raids on the, uh, on the uh, fortresses throughout the day and night to sort of weaken the, the, um, weaken the Ottomans' hold up there after um, a short while of time. So it became a war of patience, eventually. And his proposal was, Hijaz Railway, sever it off, and carry out these pinprick attacks. And the infamous man was this man on the right. His name was? T.E. Lawrence. Thomas Edward Lawrence. Lawrence of Arabia. And again, we can talk about him for an entire day. But what we can say, suffice, let's just suffice to say this. He was a graduate of, of Jesus College in Oxford. And he was actually sent throughout the early 1900s. He was a solo traveler in Syria. And as part of his thesis, as part of his dissertation, he was surveying Crusader castles across the Levant region. And his archaeological expeditions were actually sponsored by the British Museum. So he was a genuine learner and academic and archaeologist and historian. Now, when the war broke out, the British saw him as a valuable asset. His deep knowledge and affinity with the Arabs, and I mean, you can, you can even see there. In all of the pictures that he's in, he's the only Brit. He's the only British person donning um, uh, Arabian headgear and Arabian attire. Because he'd become so, uh, so um, affiliated and so connected with the um, Arab people, he identified them as, he identified himself as part of them. And at the outset of the war in 1914, the British military enlisted his help. First of all, as a, uh, as a uh, secret agent to survey Ottoman lands. Then eventually, when Sharif Hussein staged his revolt, Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, T.E. Lawrence, then became the right-hand man to Sharif Hussein. He became the right-hand advisor and counsellor of Sharif Hussein. He was the now liaison between the British and the, um, and the Sharifans as well. And I mean, he's hailed as a, as a hero in, in the West, somebody who fought for Arab independence. But at the end of the day, we know what this Arab independence was. And just to give you a bit of a spoiler, Arab independence was never given. 
At the end of the day, Arab independence, even though all the agreements were there, the Arabs were never given their independence. When it was eventually given to them in some fragmented shape or form, it was completely chaotic, completely anarchic. And it was against what the British had agreed. And at the same time, I don't want to get into a diversion here, at the same time, Sharif, Hussein and McMahon were making their agreements, actually even before that, the British had already entered into another secret backhand or, or under the table deal with the French called the sykes picot Agreement. And that agreement was, you know what, when the Ottomans are defeated in World War I, you can take this land and you can take this one. The British will have uh, the lands of Transjordan, Palestine, Jordan, modern day, and, um, and uh, Syria as well. Then parts of Syria given to the French, modern day Lebanon, and the Hijaz to the British as well. So now, they've already made an agreement with the French, and at the same time, they're promising that same piece of land to Sharif Hussein. They never, ever, ever intended on honoring the deal with Sharif Hussein. And now imagine this. Literally, this is, this is what happened. No word of a joke. Sykes and Peacock, they were, were one, uh, the, the British foreign minister, who was George Sykes, and Peacock was the front French foreign minister. In an air-conditioned room somewhere in France, they opened up, no word of a lie here, they opened up a map, and with a pen, they said, you know what, you're going to have this piece of land, you're going to have this piece of land, you're going to have that piece of land. They didn't take any of the cultural quirks and peculiarities into, tradition, in, into consideration. They didn't even consider what the Arab people themselves would want. They didn't care if they were grouping two different ethnicities together. They didn't care if they were going to be instigating warfare, tribal warfare between the Arab Bedouins. They didn't care. They just carved up land as if it was a piece of cake in their air-conditioned, cozy, comfortable room in France. That's what they did. And they had already agreed to that before Sharif Hussein and McMahon engaged in their correspondences. So now reading ourselves back into T.E. Lawrence. Yeah? So he's, he might be a hero in uh, Western culture and in the Western narrative, but at the end of the day, even though he did, he genuinely wanted to help the Arabs in their independence. But he was uh, a provocateur. He was a saboteur for the British. He knew very well what he was doing. And even afterwards, he did try to fight for Arab independence, but the damage had already been done. So he was a, a double-crossing secret agent, T.E. Lawrence, no matter how much he's romanticized and valorized here in the West. So understand the man for what he was. 130 assaults. So the plan was, it was enacted. Let's cut off the Hijaz railway and let's carry out our pinprick attacks. 130 assaults altogether were carried out. Sorry, every, in, in, uh, across a two and a half year span of the siege, 130 attacks were carried out. And in one day, this is a Muslim, Sharif Hussein. He fired 300 shells of artillery on the city of the Prophet ﷺ, on the city in Medina. 300 ordinances were shelled down onto the city of our beloved Prophet ﷺ. You can see what power and politics does to people, where even religion goes out of the window. Food and provisions were cut off and blockaded. One Ottoman soldier, and this is now where we start to see the, the religious sentiment of the, of the Ottomans. There's a common misconception Early on, people have said that the Ottomans were actually a manifestation of the Shia, which is completely baseless. It's a complete misconception. Later on, people have started to say the Ottomans weren't Islamic, in a way to undercut and delegitimize their caliphate. They were un-Islamic, and two of the most overused buzzwords today you'll find on Twitter, YouTube, is bid'ah and shirk. People just label anything as bid'ah, as an innovation, and anything as shirk, as polytheism. And unfortunately, history is completely ignored and these Ottoman caliphs and Ottoman heroes are labelled as innovators and as polytheists, which is complete propaganda. That's all it is. This incident should hopefully cement the idea as to how religious they actually were. So the Ottoman soldier, one Ottoman soldier in his memoir said, they cut off our food and provisions, severed off, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us food from the sky. What was that? An infestation of locusts. Locusts were sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are two, in a hadith the Prophet sallallahu said, there are two animals which can be eaten without having to carry out the prescribed uh, legal procedure of slaughtering, of dhabah. And they are, number one, locusts, and number two, fish. So you can just, if you want, just go fishing and start munching on a fish afterwards. And after, you can pick up locusts and just start eating them, one by one. You don't need to slaughter them. So those are the only, locusts are the only insects that we're actually allowed to eat, according to our... Um, Hanafi tradition. So locusts were sent down. Whereas some people might have taken it as an infestation, as a, um, as a pest against their crops, 
The Ottoman soldiers took this as a sign from Allah. And they were literally, in their diaries, the Ottoman soldiers write, locusts were literally dropping down from the skies. And Fakhri Pasha, when, when the infestation of locusts came around, that's, that's, that's an Ottoman stronghold there in Medina. When the infestation came around, he said to his troops, he said, make sure you gather as many of these locusts as possible and cook them because you will die out of starvation. And if you die out of starvation, who will there be to defend the Prophet ﷺ? Who will there be to defend the tomb of the Prophet ﷺ? And honestly, when I was reading these events, it, it really makes you, you know, well up and tear up about you know, how these people, they gave up so much for the Prophet ﷺ. And just think about us today. What do we do for the Prophet? This man can go on the Day of Judgment and tell the Prophet ﷺ, I laid down my life for your grave, for your tomb, for your honour, for your city. And we go to the Prophet, we couldn't even act upon one sunnah. We couldn't even do the miswak in the morning, we couldn't even wake up for salah. What kind of a message is that? And we are there carrying flags saying we love the Prophet and all these slogans and all of these, you know, these, these appealing titles as well that we love the Prophet, we're the ummatis of the Prophet but how, 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 how much do we actually think about the Prophet and defend his honour and follow his sunnah? The Prophet won't care. Imagine the feeling when you're at the, the, the pond of al Kofa on the Day of Judgment and imagine just I always chuckle at these scenes. Imagine Fakhri Pasha is there saying to the Prophet, I defended your city, I defended your honour. The Prophet's there giving him, the Prophet's there giving Fakhri Pasha water from the pond of Gulfur from his own hands. And were there, the angels guarding there, the angels say, sorry, you can't come in. Because you didn't act upon the sunnah. Off you go. Imagine the feeling there. Imagine the feeling of utter rejection and disappointment. Throughout your life, you claim to love the Prophet. And on the day of judgment, the Prophet doesn't even want to know you. Even though he sacrificed his entire life. So he said, who is there to defend the city of the Prophet? So eat as much as you can of these locusts. These men starved. The Ottoman soldiers starved. What, in two months, one-tenth of the entire 14,000 strong garrison died because of illness. These men weren't Arabs. They came from Istanbul. They might have been nominal Muslims, but as soon as the call from the Prophet's grave came, their, their, their spiritual call to defend the Prophet came, they responded instantaneously. And this is truly amazing for our Prophet Sallallahu And I read a post on somebody's status that I saw earlier. No WhatsApp, no Twitter, no Instagram, but 1.8 billion followers, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 1,400 years down the line. He didn't need a uh, whole campaign. He didn't need propaganda. People just needed to study him and be with him, be with his companions, and they loved him to bits. Imagine people today. And this is quite sad actually, because people will ridicule Isa alayhi salam and Jesus, they make movies ridiculing, disparaging, maligning Isa alayhi salam. You see people having all sorts of slogans and I, and I seek Allah's refuge for even having to utter this. At gay pride marches, you see people saying, Jesus, uh, one love Jesus. Gay pride Jesus. They're tarnishing the name of the Prophet here. Will you ever see a Christian stand up to this? But you see one person even speak out against our Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. 1.8 billion Muslims are ready to lay down their lives for that one man. That's why he is. The most influential man in history, without a doubt. And non-Muslim Western academics have attested to this fact as well. Their um, the Ottoman soldiers were dying on a day-to-day -day basis. Pestilence, disease, ravages the camp. There was dysentery and the Spanish flu as well came towards the end of their, um, of their siege. And like we said, in two months, one-tenth of the garrison had died. But they stood firm, they stood strong with their commander, Fakhri Pasha, and defended the honour of the Prophet And to be fair... The British had, they didn't really care about Medina. They saw the Arabian Peninsula as a backwater region, backwater territory. What was their true price? What was their ultimate price? Jerusalem was their ultimate price. And this is why Muslims have to study this. The most, and I can say, this is why it's one of those four incidents, one of these four events. The most, one of the most humiliating periods of time for Muslims ever in history was World War I. Why? In 1917. British troops from Egypt, set off from Egypt, captured Baghdad. The historical, metro, uh, the, 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 his, the historical uh, metropolis city, the capital of the Abbasid, Abbasid dynasty, Baghdad, was taken. You can imagine what kind of a uh, psychological hit that was to the Muslims. In, then, that was early 1917. 1917, 9th of December. David Lloyd George, the uh, Prime Minister of Britain, he sent a telegraph and a message to General Allenby in Egypt saying, I want a Christmas present. 
What do you think his Christmas present was? Jerusalem. I want Jerusalem before Christmas. And it was delivered to him on time. 9th of December, General Allenby walked through the streets of Damascus, of, of um, Jerusalem, sorry, victorious and triumphant. The 36th conqueror of Jerusalem. And the era of the Crusades echoed around. Even though he gave amnesty, credit where credit is due, General Allenby, he said, we're not going to harm or desecrate, destroy any buildings. We're going to give um, a religious uh, sanctity to all the three Abrahamic faiths. But you couldn't help as a Muslim but feel the, um, the, the memory of the Crusades being re-evoked. And even though General Allenby didn't want to call it a crusade because he had Muslim soldiers in his army. He had Egyptian Muslim soldiers. He had Indian Muslim soldiers in his army. But every single Christian soldier in that army knew and all of them were pumped up. The idea of a crusade was, throwing through their, was flowing through their blood. And when they entered, it was reminiscent of the crusades. The French general actually, walked, actually trotted in on a white horse. And that was symbolic of an apocalyptic idea from the Bible, which is Jerusalem will come back to the Christians and there'll be the four horsemen, as it's called. He wanted to um, epitomize and embody one of those four horsemen. So that's why he came in with his own white horse, uh, on his own white horse as well. A few, so that's Jerusalem. Now, the third holiest site, fallen. The year after that, uh, in, in 1918, Damascus fell. The capital of the Umayyads. And by the end of 1918, Istanbul had fallen as well. All four of the major Muslim centers of religion, civilization, of culture, of learning, fell to the Western Allied powers. And then Cairo had fallen well before that. So you can imagine as a, as a Muslim, imagine now. Imagine now we've got, I don't know, maybe people take Dubai as a, as, as a center of Islam, I don't know, of, of the Muslim world. But like, imagine all of these Muslim lands just fell like, like dominoes, one by one. Imagine the psychological blow to a Muslim. The place where the Umayyads ruled for 100 years, where the Abbasids ruled for 400 years, where the Ottomans had ruled for nearly 500 years. The Ottomans, when the Greeks, the Greeks walked in with the French, with the British, with the Russians as well, into Istanbul. And the Greeks had coveted Hagia Sophia. They wanted Hagia Sophia. They wanted to reconvert into a church. The Ottomans were so desperate, they even contemplated burning the, church, burning the, the mosque down. So it wouldn't fall into their hands. These were desperate times for the Muslims. So the British didn't care about what was happening in Medina. This was now, for all they cared, this was a struggle between Fakhri Pasha, the Ottomans, and now Sharif Hussein here. So a very difficult deliberation took place within the Ottoman High Command, which was, do we keep Fakhri Pasha in place and his garrison, the Hijaz Expeditionary Force, or do we reinforce our garrisons in Syria because Palestine's falling, Syria's about to fall, what do we do? So they resolved actually to relocate and transfer his forces to Syria. Now there were two people, Fakhri Pasha was going to be uh, relinquished of his duties and we're going to have two new, two possible candidates to replace him as their commander. Number one was um, an unknown figure at the time, maybe to us quite unknown. Uh, he later on became the, uh, uh, the minister of war. His name skipped my mind. The other one is again another infamous figure. His name was at that time, his, his name was uh, Grand Colonel Mustafa Kemal. Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. Ataturk isn't his name. Ataturk means father of the Turks. And now, has this, has this ever popped into your mind? People have been to Turkey. Every hotel you visit, every shop you visit, every government, civil center you visit, his portrait is plastered everywhere. His sinister looking face greets you wherever you go in Turkey and they revere him as a hero. In the constitution, it's actually uh, illegal. You can, you can be punished for criticizing Ataturk. But we know what he did. Very simply, he engaged in a, an aggressive, militant suppression of Islam. He converted mosques. He banished, outlawed scholarship. He, uh, he destroyed mosques. He forced all the scholars underground. He then tried to remove all any semblance of Muslim attire, you weren't allowed to wear the face veil, headscarf was a thing of the past, even the Ottoman fez. The Ottoman fez was brought in to modernize the Ottomans before they used to wear turbans. The Ottoman fez was brought in in the mid-1800s to westernize and Europeanize the Ottomans. Even Ataturk saw that as too much of an Islamic sign, it needs to be gotten rid of. He changed the Adhan from Arabic into, into Turkish. And watch it online, it's horrendous. You just get chill, uh, chills shivering through your body. He changed Allah to Tengri. Tengri is uh, an old Turkic word for God. 
and during the time of uh, Genghis Khan, Hulagu Khan, they used it to refer to the uh, Lord of the Eternal Blue Sky, which they saw as the ultimate God, and some people say that was Allah. It's, it's completely horrifying and shocking. So that's what Ataturk did. His militant secularization. He was a, no doubt he was an enemy of Islam. No doubt he was somebody who was opposed to Islam. So anyway, Ataturk was, uh, was nominated, but he said, to the Ottoman High Command, why do I want to be in charge of a garrison which is just about to be relocated? I mean, why would I be in charge of Medina when I'm no, no longer going to be in charge of Medina? I'm going to be reposted to Syria. So both of them said no, and they eventually had to send, just leave Fakhri Pasha in his place. And whilst these deliberations were going on, there was a slogan which was sung in schools and army encampments around the Muslim world. And this, was, this just shows, illustrates the attachment and the commitment people around the Ottoman domain had for, had for Islam. And it was, we will not leave the one who rests in Medina, we will rather die and rescue the motherland. That was a slogan going around. Children, people in uh, uh, civil services, people in the army, all of them, that was the slogan. Because this is the resting place of the Prophet ﷺ. Now the Ottomans, they officially dismissed Sharif Hussein, not that it made a difference, and they appointed his cousin, uh, Ali Haidar, who was from a rival clan, to try and spite the treasonous Sharif, try to undermine his authority in the Hijaz. Didn't work out well, let's just put it like that, and he ended up leaving. When he did leave, Ali Haidar, he said to Fakhri Pasha, very, very um, emotional speech, he said, he said, look, the protection of this tomb of the Prophet is in your hands now. And, sorry, the protection of this tomb is in the hands of Allah, and you are now Allah's instrument. I leave it in your care, be, be wary and worthy of this trust. And Fakhri Pasha took that to heart. He barricaded himself into Medina, and th as the Brits were making their lightning fast progress across the uh, Levantine front, Jerusalem fell, Damascus fell, uh, Sharif Hussein was becoming more and more impatient. Because if they finish their conquest there in the Levantine lands, then they're going to be stood there looking at Sharif, you know, looking at the watch. I mean, come on, we've given you so much time and you've still not managed to dislodge the Ottomans. So Sharif Hussein, out of pure desperation, he sent a letter. If I have any more, I don't think I have any more slides. That's the end one. We'll, Leave it on that slide. He sent a letter to um, Fakhri Pasha demanding his surrender. So Fakhri Pasha replied, and this is absolutely amazing. I had a picture of the original, of, of a photocopy of the original letter that he sent back. And this, this really shows how in touch they were with their side and how much they loved the Prophet. I can't put in any other words how much they loved, how much Fakhri Pasha loved the Prophet. He, he started his address to Sharif Hussein by saying, to him who broke the power of Islam, to him who rebelled against the Caliph, to him who split the Muslim world asunder, which is exactly what he did. And he later on went on to narrate a dream. Fakhri Pasha had a dream. He said, in my dream, I was overtaken. I was so perturbed and I was so then stressed out by the, by the, um, by the siege and the barricade and trying to defend Medina that I just uh, randomly, spontaneously fell asleep. Whilst I was asleep, I dreamt of myself walking my way through the streets and alleyways of Medina. And whilst I was there, I was led by, there was a person in front of me who came. And he was the most beautiful, handsome person I'd ever seen in my life. And he said, Fakhri, follow me. So I followed him. And he had his hand on his hip just underneath his robe. And I followed him for a few steps and then I woke up. When I woke up, I realized this man was none other than the Prophet ﷺ. And he was taking me into his protection. And he said... Fakhri Pasha said in his correspondence to Sharif Hussein, I am now under the protection of the Prophet who is my most high commander. I am busy myself with the strengthening and the defences and the building of roads and squares in Medina. And he said at the end, this was like his, his mic drop, uh, one, one line at the end. He said, please don't trouble me with your useless requests. And then he ended the letter there. And he sent it back off to um, Sharif Hussein. And he was absolutely infuriated to Sharif Hussein when he received this. So he complained to his British overlords, his masters, and that he got the High Commissioner of Egypt, Reginald Wingate, to demand Fakhri Pasha's surrender. So he again wrote a letter, quite harsh this time, Reginald Wingate. And Fakhri responded with just a few very simple slogans. And this, today, use this to bolster and strengthen your identity as a Muslim. Be unapologetically Muslim. You don't have to defend your faith. Because you know your faith is, is, is the truth. You have nothing to apologize for. You have nothing to, to then lay down your respect and honor for. Because your respect lies in your faith. Like Umar radiallahu anhu said, we were nothing before Islam. We were nomads. We were Bedouins. 
We were the worst of the worst. It was only Islam that gave us respect. Allah says in the Quran, respect is only reserved for Allah and His Prophet. If you connect yourself to any one of these two institutions, the Quran or the Sunnah, you will find respect. You will be receiving respect from the divine fountainhead of the Quran and Sunnah. The moment you try to cut yourself off from the Quran and Sunnah, you can try to look for respect anywhere you will not find it. And I guarantee you that. This is encapsulated in Fakhri's response. He said a few short phrases in response to Reginald Wingate. I'm an Ottoman. I'm a Muslim. I come from the family of Baligolu, which was his family. I am a soldier. End of letter. Sent it back off. I'm an Ottoman. You can't change me. I'm a Muslim. I'm defending the Prophet I'm a soldier. I will fight to my last breath for the Prophet and he sent it back. And that's exactly what he did. He was resolute and he was ready to defend Medina to the last man, to the last bullet, to the last breath. In which year did World War I end? 1918. Very famous. You can't forget this. World War I ended in the 11th hour of the 11th month, the 11th day of the 11th month. So 11 a.m., 11th of November, not 11, yeah, sorry, 11 a.m., 11th of November, 1918, World War I ended. There was, however, a very important armistice, ceasefire, which was signed a few days prior, about two weeks prior, 30th of October, the armistice of Mudros, which is in modern-day Greece. And the armistice of Mudros was an end to the Middle Eastern theatre, and it effectively secured the victory of the British and the defeat of the Ottomans. All the, the, the armistice very clearly stated in article number 16, all Ottoman garrisons stationed in Arabia are to lay down their arms and submit to the next British commander. And this always makes me laugh. So the letter got to Fakhri Pasha. And you can imagine where this is going. The news reached Fakhri Pasha. And he famously replied to the envoy, to the uh, herald. He said, the weapons we had protected with our sacrifices would have to be laid down at the feet of bare-legged Bedouins. Meaning, if you want me to surrender, I'm going to be surrendering to bare-legged Bedouins and a British captain who had insulted our honour. Even if the occupying Allied powers turn Istanbul upside down, it would not change my decision to defend Medina. That's what he said. At that time, the British actually threatened to destroy the Ottoman fortresses situated on the Dardanelles Strait, which is leading in from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean. Very important strategic position. And the Allied powers were, if Fakhri, imagine the whole world was at a standstill because of Fakhri. The Allied powers said, we're going to destroy, decimate your fortresses if Fakhri doesn't stand down. And yet he was in the face of literal destruction of his homeland. I don't care, Medina. This shows nationalism has no place in Islam. You should feel an, affi an, an affiliation, an affinity to your nationality. That's, that's human because that's part of your culture. But it should never be prioritized over Islam like Fakhri did here. It would not change my decision to defend Medina. So the Ottomans, they had to send another delegation. The young Turk sent another delegation from the Ottoman high command ordering him to stand down. Again, and he refused. He said, I will only stand down if I receive an irade from the Ottoman Caliph, which is a direct edict from the Ottoman Caliph, Sultan um, Muhammad V himself. If he gives me an order to stand down, I'll only, I'll, I'll, I'll only abide from his authority. And he said, because Medina isn't in the possession of the young Turks, and it's not in the authority of a government. Medina is directly linked with the Caliph. This Caliph comes from a long line of succession going all the way back to the Prophet So I will only submit to the authority of the Caliph. So everybody knew he was just stalling for time and trying to buy time. Sharif was getting annoyed in his camp and his troops and his commanders, his sons and his Bedouins were starting to become uh, agitated and restless and were itching to go. And at this moment, Sharif Hussein, I mean, his corpse would have been dragged out of Medina before he surrendered. He ascended the pulpit of the Prophet ﷺ. And just to, bear, just to give you an idea, there were 80,000 inhabitants in Medina before. So during the two and a half years, Fakhri actually facilitated their relocation somewhere else and provided them with uh, money and provision and supplies because he didn't want the, the civilian population to be embroiled in warfare. So the majority of Medina was actually, imagine this, for nearly two and a half years, the majority of Medina was actually run and operated by the soldiers. 
The soldiers were pretty much the sole inhabitants. Some reports say when the Sharifan forces entered later on, there were only 41 inhabitants there. And the Ottomans, the Ottoman soldiers, they had boarded up all of the residences' houses and their dwellings to show that we're going to leave all of their possessions there. We're not going to touch anything. It doesn't belong to us. Now, people know how unruly and undisciplined soldiers can be. And for them, it's just open game to women, children, possessions, looting and pillaging would be rife. But Fakhri kept his troops under tight knit. He was, he was developing mortal diseases towards the end. But some of his own soldiers said he used to plow the fields. They kept the agri- Imagine, the farmers of Medina had left, but him and his soldiers were, 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 um, were uh, maintaining the fields and keeping the agriculture to a, um, to a standard as well. So Fakhri ascended the pulpit. Imagine, next time you go to Medina, just imagine, this mosque at one moment in time, at one moment in history, unprecedented moment in history, was filled with just soldiers and had Fakhri Pasha stood on the pulpit of the Prophet And he said, O men, I call out to you to defend him, the Prophet and his city, to the last bullet, to the last breath, regardless of the strength of the enemy. May Allah help us and may the, and may the prayer of the Prophet be with us. All soldiers of the heroic Turkish army, and he called them, O Mehmetchiks, O little Muhammads, come forward and swear to me, your, swear to me, through the honor of your faith, that you will give the supreme sacrifice of your life for the Prophet Just imagine the scene: soldiers coming up, pledging their allegiance, bearing arms, and making their way to the um, to their defenses and their turrets as well. On the morning of 9th of January, 1919, there was actually a mutiny which had erupted in Fakhri's own camp because some of his soldiers were exhausted, some of his soldiers were tired. They hadn't seen the outside of Medina for nearly two and a half years. They'd been cut off from the rest of the world. And they were growing restless. So under one of his uh, officers called Amin, they'd actually set up a, uh, a, a secret movement called the Central Committee. And their slogan was, let's get up. Meaning, let's get up and remove uh, Fakhri and just make her out of Medina. Some of them were on the brink of complete psychological breakdown and they wanted to surrender. But Fakhri carried on. Imagine, he's got Sharif Hussein, he's got his own people to deal with, his own mutinous troops. Then he's got not all of his troops, only um, um, a, a few of his uh, soldiers. And he's got the Ottoman high command badgering him to surrender. He's got so much on his head, yet he keeps a calm, cool, and composed demeanor and he delivers that riveting speech. And this time, this is probably, I've lost count how many envoys the Ottoman high command had to send to get Fakhri to surrender. They sent another one and he was overwhelmed, Fakhri, so he retired to the tomb of the Prophet ﷺ, which was still accessible then. And he just laid back, leaning on the tomb of the Prophet when his own men came and arrested him. His own men came, arrested him, put him in cuffs and literally had to drag him out. They had to drag him out of the city of the Prophet ﷺ, and he laid his sword in a very ceremonial and symbolic fashion on the tomb of Fatima radiallahu anha. Laid his sword down and made his exit from the city of Medina. That marks the end of the siege of Medina in 10th of June 1919. Fakhri was taken as, uh, to Egypt as a uh, POW, as a prisoner of war, along with the surviving 8,000 soldiers. Fif- started at 15,000. His, his troops nearly halved. There was very minimal fighting. But they all, most of them died because of disease or the poor conditions in Medina itself or starvation. Then he was incarcerated into Malta, into a Maltan prison for two years. And he was later released in 1921. And then he, now, he was now posted as a Turkish ambassador in Afghanistan, actually, for six years until 1926. Whilst he was there, he was involved in collecting donations and funds for the Ottoman independence movement against the Greeks, against the British, against the Russians, which was actually led by Atatürk. So that gives you some context. Why is Atatürk uh, lionized today? Because he's seen as the hero of uh, the Turkish people, because he fought a war of independence. Fair enough, that's what, that is what he did. Cre- credit where credit is due. But what he did after he, he abolished, he abolished the caliphate. He is the one that abolished the caliphate because he didn't see any significance or religious importance behind the caliphate. That's what he did. And that was the first of many steps of aggression he took against the Muslim faith. Now people say, and I've heard people say this, why do you care what happened to Atatürk? I mean, let the Turkish people decide the fate of Atatürk and let them talk about Atatürk and criticize him or evaluate him. 
because he's Turkish. Who says they have a monopoly over Ataturk? This, whenever it's anything to do with Islam, this is a global problem. This is an issue for me, or me and you. Even though it happened 100 years ago in Turkey. This is an issue which affects every single one of us. He destroyed an institution which had been in place for nearly 1,300 years. So obviously, we're going to take it personally. So anyway, um, Fakhri was involved there. And the funds actually went through a very... He, he was Fakhri in, in Afghanistan was a foundational cornerstone pillar to the central Khilafah movement. And they were a group of uh, intellectuals and elites and people from across the Muslim world who wanted to keep the caliph in place when the post was being threatened by every single institution around it. And he was also uh, partnered with the Indian Khilafah movement. That might be a topic for another day. And this just goes to show the symbolic nature of a caliph. Even if a caliph has zero power, just him being there has symbolic power for Muslims. They see a figure they can rally under. They see somebody who represents the Prophet. They see somebody who represents God's reign on earth, God's supremacy on earth. He is a vice gerent of God. That's what the Khalifa is. That's what it literally means. Khalifa comes from the word um, يتخلف, which means to be a vice gerent of anyone. And in this case, it's a representative of Allah on earth. Somebody who gives Muslims political stability, political independence, their own safe space, who can shield them from the um, outside intrusions of the enemies of Islam. So he was heavily involved in that. He retired in 1936 and then he died in 1948. So to bring our very long session on Fakhri Pasha to a close now, there was one colonel of the Egyptian army, part of the uh, British forces that had helped Sharif Hussein take Hijaz and he was an Egyptian colonel he served with the British and when he entered into the city he said the city was in good order for the entire two and a half years they were there they kept everything pretty much pristine and he said the natives of Medina lost more during the 12 days of Arab, of Arab occupation after Fakhri's departure than they did during the entire two and a half years in Fakhri's hands the moment Fakhri left, the Arabs, especially Sharif Hussein's sons, they gave their soldiers a blank check. General amnesty, freedom to do what you want. They raided, the, these are the forces of Sharif Hussein, native Arabs, Bedouins. They raided 4,000 homes in Medina that had been boarded up and locked up by the Ottomans so that the possessions of the inhabitants can be saved and protected till they return. They looted all of that. And they pillaged and they ransacked Medina for an entire 12 days. Now just imagine those scenes. Imagine how heartfelt the, uh, the, the inhabitants, imagine how Fakhli would have felt as well. He just defended two and a half years and it's all been for nothing because they completely ravaged the city. So now we come to an end. Fakhli Pasha's titles, as given to him by the British, they call them the Tiger of the Desert. He was known as the defender, the bulwark of Medina. He was classed as the last knight of the last caliphs. Because remember, Sultan Abdul Hamid, after him, Sultan Muhammad V, then Sultan Muhammad VI, then Sultan Abdul Majid II, then nobody. Then finish. So there are only a few caliphs left. So he was dubbed as the last knight of the caliphs as well. And even after his departure, there was a buzz about Fakhri Pasha. He had already received the legendary status during his own lifetime. People would actually, from around the Ottoman world, from around the Muslim world, even Arabs, would visit Medina for tourism. Tourism for what you might say, for the Prophet's grave, for the relics of the companions. They would visit the places Fakhri uh, slept at. They would visit the place where Fakhri had worked by himself on the farms. So he became sort of like, a, like an icon, like a, like a cultural celebrity in the Arabian lands. Bedouins would want to call their sons Fakhri. And there was remarks and sayings going around which just show how much they appreciated Fakhri. Some of the Arab Bedouins, they'd say when their horse would go to the trough to drink water and then the horse would shy away, he wouldn't drink the water. Then the Bedouins would say, oh what's up, did you see Fakhri in the water there? And, and, and he scared you away. So that's how much they revered um, Fakhri as well. And there's a bit more to finish but I know we're short on time now. So now, Let's put Fakhri to a side now. Sharif Hussein. What happened to Sharif Hussein? Sharif Hussein, when it came to the end of World War I, the Paris Peace Conference, Sharif Hussein was represented by his son Faisal and uh, T.E. Lawrence at the Paris Peace Conference. And that later on manifested and translated into the Treaty of Versailles, which is what we're going to do with the Ottoman lands. And surprise, surprise, the British and the French took everything for themselves. 
So you can see how Sharif Hussein's duplicitous dealings, his deceit, his backstabbing against the entire Muslim state was for absolutely nothing. And he died a miserable death. He was actually exiled. Sharif Hussein was exiled to, I think it was Cyprus, and he died a miserable, lonely death there. This epitomizes a, 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 a poem that some scholars have said, which is, نُمَزِّقُ دِينَنَا بِتَرْقِيعِ دُنْيَانَا وَلَا دِينُنَا يَبْقَى وَلَا دُنْيَانَا We compromise and jeopardize our religious values for just a meager, paltry gain of the world. And at the end of everything, neither does our religion remain, neither does our world remain. And that's epitomizing Sharif Hussein. He compromised the most important thing to a Muslim at that time, which was unity. What did he get in return? Absolutely nothing. And to sort of placate him and to appease him, the British gave three of his sons dominion in some surrounding kingdoms. So Abdullah was given the land of Transjordan, and that later then evolved into the Hashimat kingdom of Jordan we see today. They're not even from Jordan, they're, they're from Saudi Arabia. So that's a continuation today, you can, see, you can still see them. The king, present king of Jordan today is the great grandson of Sharif Hussein. Another one of his sons, Faisal, he was given, Faisal was given Iraq as a governor. He called himself a king. Within a few months, he was deposed. The Iraqis did not want him there whatsoever. Failed abortive attempt. And they all claimed to be kings. The last one was Ali. And he was propped up in the Hijaz to at least show that the British honored their treaty in some way. And he was in charge for a year. He actually tried to lay claim to the Caliphate as well. And in 1925, he was then deposed by... The Ali Saud, who were again backed by the British. So, one key theme that links everything together is you have to stand together as an ummah. And that starts from home. That starts with your spouses, with your family, with your children, with your colleagues, with your friends, with people in the mosque, with the wider society. Then we can have our global aspirations of a united Muslim front. And to finish off with a very, with a very poignant question, quote of, um, of with a very poignant uh, Turkish adage which is very often the arrow that strikes the eagle is usually made from its own feathers so we have to be careful and you can see here how the British have always had a hand in dismembering the Muslim state in this in in wedging a divide between Muslims they did it in India they did it in Arabia they did it in North Africa they did it everywhere Sheikh al-Islam Hussein Ahmed Madani, who was a very famous scholar of the Deobundi fraternity and was a freedom fighter in India, he's often overshadowed by Gandhi. And there's a reason for that, because the Hindu nationalists want to wash the pages of Indian history and Indian revolution of any Muslims. They don't want anything to do with Muslims and the Indian revolution. He said, if you're in the middle of the ocean and you come across two fish fighting with each other, just know the British had a hand in that somehow. The British did something there somehow. So we end on that note. And I apologize for taking so much time. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he grants us true understanding of our religion, of our history. And he blesses us with unity. That also desired trait of unity. Ameen. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.